course. Nope, that's not what we want. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're talking about chapter 17 from Campbell's Biology and Focus and it's going to go over viruses. Now I'm just going to put a disclaimer out there right now. The coronavirus is very prominent in the media and on everyone's mind. Um, hopefully this will educate you a little bit about the situation so you don't buy into all of the media hype. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so viruses, a borrowed life. Okay, so a virus is an infectious particle. Notice it's not something that's alive. It is an, infe an infectious particle that's consisting of a gene or genes and a protein coat. So essentially here we have DNA or RNA, some sort of nucleic acid or genetic information, and a pretty package called a protein coat. There is nothing else to a virus. It is a particle. It is not something that is alive, okay? Viruses lead to a kind of borrowed life. So they have to exist in this kind of gray area between like life forms and chemicals because they can overpower cell machinery in order to utilize this cell's machinery to make more of itself. But if it's just a whole bunch of viruses floating around the air on you know environmental surfaces, they can't do anything. They're just particles. They're not anything that is alive. They are like a gray area between the biotic and abiotic factors of life. Okay, so a virus consists of a nucleic acid and a protein coat. Those are the two things that we just previously talked about. So even the largest known virus is barely visible under a light microscope. They're very, very small particles. Again, not alive. Some viruses can actually be crystallized, just has to do with like the structure of the protein coat on the outside of them. Um, viruses are not cells but they do have nucleic acid contained within a protein. So a cell is a basic unit of life. A virus is not alive. So a virus is not a cell. This is something that people get confused that a virus and a bacteria are the same thing. They are not. Bacteria, all bacteria are cells. They are prokaryotic cells. A virus is a particle. It is not capable of any of life's functions. It requires a host, which would be a cell, which is something alive. So viral genomes. So the viral genome can consist of either DNA or RNA, and this can be double or single stranded in either case. So we have a nucleic acid. We know that we have to have that because that's the blueprint for life. These are the directions that the virus needs in order to make more virus. Okay, so depending on the type of nucleic acid, a virus is called a DNA virus or an RNA virus. An RNA virus is also called a retrovirus. Anything with the prefix of retro is talking about something that contains RNA. R, RNA, retro, has an R, it's convenient. So the capsids and the envelopes are on the outside. So the capsid is the protein shell that encloses the viral genome. So if it's a present, the DNA is gonna be in the middle, the RNA is gonna be in the middle, and the package, all the pretty wrapping in the box is gonna be the protein shell. It's a delivery mechanism, essentially, that's the capsid. So capsids are built from protein subunits that are called capsomeres, okay? And a capsid um, can have different structures just based on the type of virus it is, because a virus is gonna work kind of like a lock and key with the receptors on the outside of our cells. So each one is going to have a different shape based on which type of cell it's going to actually affect in the body. So here are some of the different shapes that our cells or our um, viruses can be in. So it's all kind of based on that pretty package, the protein coating, the capsids. They all have different shapes depending on what kind of cell they're going to actually infect. So you can see you have the tobacco mosaic virus, which actually affects plants. You can have plant viruses, aden an adenovirus, the influenza virus, and the bacteriophage T4. So we talked about T4 uh, previously. They look like little cookie robots. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna draw your attention to the influenza virus here. So influenza virus is an encapsulated virus. They have these little glycoproteins around the outside. It kind of looks like a little fuzzy ball. 
this is the um, same shape as the coronavirus for those of us that are watching the news and everything right now. Okay, so it kind of has a similar structure, but you'll notice even though there's different shapes here, you still have the nucleic acid in the center of the molecule. And then on the outside, you have the protein coat. Again, that's the part that's going to look different based on what kind of cell it's going to go off and infect. So some viruses have membranous envelopes that help them to infect hosts. The membranes on the outside kind of like help to protect the virus from the immune system before they can actually get into a cell. Um, these viral envelopes are derived from the host cell's membrane and contain a combination of viral and host cell molecules. So think about that. The viral envelope, so what's on the outside of the virus, are derived, they come from the host cell's membrane. So if you have virus particles inside of you that have envelopes, they're stealing portions of your membrane in order to shield themselves from your immune system, which is really incredibly intelligent for a virus, right? Because if the outside of the virus looks exactly like the outside of all of your cells or almost exactly because you still have some viral components there. But for the most part, at a quick glance, your immune system is going to be like, OK, cool, you're supposed to be here. You're part of the pack. Sounds good. Moving on. But really, they're disguising themselves in order to move around your body and infect other cells, which makes them, like I said, incredibly intelligent, even though they're not alive. Um, bacteriophages are also called phages. We talked about these previously. They are viruses that only infect bacteria. So bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. That's why it's named as such. Um, <clears throat> they have the most complex capsids found among viruses because they have like these little injectosomes and all of this. Um, so the phages have elongated capsid heads that enclose the DNA. So it's like the head of a little cookie robot. And then the uh, protein tail pieces attach the phage to the host cell and inject the phage DNA inside. So that's what makes up the injectosome and like the little legs to help anchor the virus onto the bacteria. Uh, viruses replicate only in host cells. So one of the classifications of life is that you are able to reproduce. So viruses cannot reproduce unless they're inside of something that is alive, which would be a host cell because all cells are the smallest you know, unit of life. Okay, so viruses are obligate intracellular parasites because they take over your cell's machinery in order to do their bidding, which means that they can only replicate within a host cell. So a bunch of virus particles, again, they are particles, they are not alive. Particles just kind of chilling in the environment cannot make more virus. It's just those couple particles. Once they get inside of a host cell, you know, whether you inhale them, you, you know, lick a doorknob or something, don't do that. It's disgusting. People never wash their hands, right? <clears throat> Once that gets inside of your body and it starts to have access to your cells, that's when it gets dangerous, okay? Um, so each virus has a host range, which is a limited number of host cells that it can infect. Again, structure dictates function. So the structure of a virus is going to dictate which cells it can attach to. Because obviously, like, let's talk coronavirus, it's an upper respiratory infection. It's not going to travel to your intestines and try to attach to those cells because it's not the right puzzle piece shape. They're not going to fit together. So its host range is only your mucosal linings of the upper respiratory tract. It would not be your intestinal tract cells. They wouldn't have the same shape to be compatible with each other. So that's the limited host cells that it can actually infect. Okay, so the general features of viral replication cycles, there are two main cycles that we're gonna talk about that all viruses follow one or the other, sometimes both if you're the more complicated path. Okay, so once a viral genome has entered into the cell, the cell begins to manufacture viral proteins. So again, the virus is not alive. It gets its DNA into the host cell. Now, when there's DNA in the host cell, the host cell is gonna go, oh, okay, DNA, let's go ahead, transcribe, translate, and make a protein out of this. That's exactly what the virus wants it to do. It's basically taking over the manufacturing plants, all of these little organelles that help the cell function in order to copy its own DNA and make its own viral particle, you know, capsids and things like that. <clears throat> okay, so the virus makes um, use of the host enzymes, the ribosomes, the tRNA, amino acids, ATP, and other molecules. Like I said, the virus is only nucleic acid and protein. So it's gonna copy that nucleic acid a billion and a half times. And then it's going to make more protein, which is gonna use, you know, enzymes, um, our ribosomes to make proteins, right? Through transcription translation in order to make more of the coat. And then it's gonna slap the DNA or the RNA inside of that protein coat and boom, you have a new virus. But that's happening a billion times. It's happening a whole lot, okay? 
Um, the viral nucleic acid molecules and capsimir spontaneously self-assemble into a new virus particle. So once all the pieces are created, then they kind of come together like a little puzzle and boom, you have a whole bunch of new virus particles. Okay, so then these exit the host cell, usually by damaging or destroying it. Think about a water balloon that you put too much water in. It's going to pop. Okay, essentially the same thing is going to happen with these viral particles. They are just overcoming the cell. There's so many of them that they lyse the cell, they break it open, and then boom, there's a billion new little viruses that are now swimming through your bloodstream in order to go infect other cells. That's how, that's one method of viral reproduction. The other one utilizes that, but it also gets a little hairier, right? But that is like just a general, the virus puts the DNA in, makes copies of itself, breaks a cell, releases itself. That's basically what a virus does. So here's an image of that. So the virus is going to get its DNA into the host cell. Once the DNA is into the inside the host cell, it takes over. It's going to stop the cellular production of everything, and it's actually going to start making copies of its own DNA. It's going to make protein for itself. It's going to make all of the little pieces, and then you're going to self-assemble the viral particles, and then they will be released. So that's what's happening here in this picture. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the um, cycles of phages. So phages are the best understood of all the viruses. We can study them very easily because we cannot be infected by them, right? So phages only infect bacteria and we're trying to use them for tools to help to target cancer eventually. They're a huge topic of research right now. So phages are the best understood of all the viruses. They're very easy to study because they pose no risk to us. Okay, so the phages have two reproductive mechanisms, the lytic and the lysogenic cycles. So we're gonna talk about those. The lytic cycle. I like to think lytic is quick. Lytic is quick, it is a quick cycle. So the lytic cycle is a um, phage replicative cycle that's going to culminate in the death of the host cell. So again, virus wants to get its DNA inside of the host cell. The host cell is gonna make a bunch of copies of the virus. They're all going to self-assemble and then boom, burst out of the cell. That's what the lytic cycle is. So the lytic cycle produces new phages and lyses or breaks open the host cell's cell wall or cell membrane, releasing the progeny viruses. So the new baby viruses that were just created inside of that cell. So a phage that reproduces only by the lytic cycle is also in the virulent phage. It's a very virulent phage because its job is to just basically go and infect, okay? Um, bacteria have defenses against phages, including restriction enzymes that recognize and cut up certain phage DNA. Once they find them in the cell, it's like, oh, hey, this is not supposed to be here. Let me cut this up. So there's some enzymes that are floating around trying to help protect them, okay? But this is the lytic cycle. It is quick. The DNA gets in, replicates. The proteins are going to replicate, they self-assemble, and then they're going to bust out of that cell. That is a very virulent phage, and it is the lytic cycle. This is what's happening here. You have attachment of the bacteria phage to the bacteria cell, and then you have the entry of the phage DNA and the degradation of the host DNA. Why does it degrade the host DNA? Well, if the virus is taking over, it doesn't want any competition. It says, oh, no, 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 you're going to stop what you're doing, and you're actually going to start making this protein. This direction here, this DNA, this RNA that I'm giving you, this is going to be your new, you know, holy book for what you're creating. So it actually completely disintegrates the host cells DNA. So you're not making any of the cells information anymore. Um, then you have the synthesis of the viral genomes and the proteins, then they're going to self-assemble, and then they will lyse the cell, releasing themselves into the, um, you know, extracellular environment, wherever that may be. The next cycle is called the lysogenic cycle. Now let's look at the word lysogenic. Lysogenic is a longer word than lytic. Lytic was quick, right? Lysogenic, well, it's a longer word. It's a longer process, okay? It's also genic. It kind of looks like the word gene a little. That's because it is, okay? So let's talk about this one. So the lysogenic cycle, which we know is a longer cycle that has to include genes somehow, just based on the name. Lysogenic cycle replicates the phage genome without destroying the host. It doesn't want to kill the host. It wants to live inside of the host. It's even a worse parasite than our lytic um, cycle uh, phages. So phages that use both the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle are called temporophages. Um, and we'll talk about that later. So the viral DNA molecule is incorporated into the host cell's chromosome. So think about that. The viral DNA that's injected into the host cell doesn't just, you know, say, okay, let's get rid of the host cell's DNA. 
no, 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 we're going to keep the host cell's DNA in this case. And actually, we're going to stick ourselves in the middle of the host cell's DNA. So anytime that the cell is going to replicate, boom, we're going to be there too, because we have become one with the host cell DNA. We are all the same. It's just a bunch of A, T, G, and C. Those DNA polymerases don't know any difference. They're just like, yep, that's an A. I can pair it with a T, moving on. Okay. So that's how that works. The lysogenic cycle actually takes viral DNA and implants it into the host cell's chromosome. It becomes part of those genes. Okay, so the integrated viral DNA is known as a prophage. So that's when it is incorporated inside of the host cell's DNA. As you can see, this is probably, you know, worse to get because it becomes part of your DNA then it's gonna be there, right? It's gonna be there through every replication. So anytime that cell splits, mitosis, you're gonna split, or um, binary fission in the case of bacteria cells, when they split, boom, that next one has it as well. So this is a much more severe kind of virus. Okay, so every time, this is what I was just saying, love it. So every time the host divides, it copies the phage DNA and passes the copies onto the daughter cells. So now you're just perpetuating this virus. You're doing its bidding without it even being really active. It's just like laying dormant, just sleeping, chilling out in the DNA. So a single infection can give rise to a large population of bacteria carrying the virus in prophage form. Remember that prophage form is when the DNA is actually incorporated into the host cell DNA. So the viral DNA is kind of hiding out. And again, it, the cell doesn't know that it's there because it's a bunch of A, T, G, and C. It can't be like, oh, that A doesn't go here. It doesn't know that. It's just going to be like, oh, I can pair this with something. Great. Wonderful. Chargoff's rule. It's a thing. Okay. So any environmental signal that can trigger the virus genome to exit the bacterial chromosome and switch to the lytic mode is what actually transfers from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle. Okay. So here's that picture that I was talking about. I don't absolutely love this picture because I think it's a little bit misleading, but we're going to work with it. So basically, the DNA is going to be inserted from the virus into the cell. And then in the lytic cycle, lytic is quick, right? It's a very quick cycle. It wants to get in, make copies, get out. So the DNA gets in. You're going to degrade the host cell DNA. You're going to create copies of the virus. Then the virus particles are going to lyse the cell to release, release the phage to the environment. And then that's going to happen again. All of those viral particles will go off. They'll attach to other bacterial cells. They'll inject their DNA. Then you're going to have the degradation of the host cell DNA. Copy, get out. That's how it happens. Lytic is quick. It just wants to get in, make copies, bust out. That's how that one wants to work. Okay. Now the lysogenic, like I said, this picture is not great, but we're just going to work with it. The lysogenic cycle, lysogenic, it's a long cycle, long name, long cycle. Genic refers to genes. Okay. So we have the bacteriophage that is inserting the DNA into the host cell. Then it's going to actually become part of the chromosome, the host cell chromosome. It's all going to be one piece of DNA now. So anytime that cell goes through, okay, we're going to skip this and we're going to drop down here. Okay, the prophage is what it's called when you have the DNA of the virus attached to the bacterial DNA here, when it's actually all one chromosome now. So then anytime that cell splits, you now are carrying that viral particle in each copy of that cell, okay? But something will happen. This is a temperate virus. Remember that it can switch back over to the lytic cycle if something in the environment triggers it to happen, okay? So we have our copies. We have a lot of cells that have copies of this viral DNA hidden within the host cell chromosome. And then we have something that triggers it to recircularize here. It's going to break off from the host cell DNA, and we're gonna switch over to the lytic cycle. So it's kind of like it makes a little figure eight. Do you see how that would work? You have entry, it becomes the prophage, you have copies, there's still the prophage. Oh, we're gonna switch over to the lytic cycle. Okay, and I'll give you an example of like um, herpes, like oral herpes, right? Like on your mouth, like if you get like a bump on your lip and it's like a fever blister sort of thing herpes of the mouth, okay? Um, sometimes environmental changes, like um, if you get a weird sunburn, like sun exposure on your lips, if you have a lot of stress, um, your diet can actually trigger an outbreak. So herpes is a um, lysogenic cycle. It is there forever. That's why it's very difficult to treat. You can treat the symptoms, but not so much like removing it from the DNA in your cells. It is a lysogenic virus, so it embeds itself into your chromosomes 
So then when you copy your cells, then you're going to copy that and each one of those new cells now carries that virus as well. It's lysogenic, it becomes part of you, okay? Um, you don't have outbreaks every single day of your entire life. You have them occasionally, right? And they can be controlled with medication, like to have less outbreaks and things like that. But you're really controlling the triggers. And like I said, the triggers can be a whole lot of things from diet to stress to sun exposure, things like that, right? So um, that's essentially what's happening here. In this picture with our little bacteriophages, something in that bacteria's environment has now made it advantageous for this um, lysogenic cycle to switch over to the lytic cycle. So lytic is quick, gets in, copies, gets out. Lysogenic is dormant. It stays within the host cell's chromosome, hides out until an opportunity presents itself for it to switch over to the lytic cycle. But now remember, when it goes into the lytic cycle, it makes a whole bunch of the virus and it busts out. Now all of those can go and inject their DNA and become dormant again in new cells. So it's really spreading the infection, but you might not know immediately that it's spreading the infection. And in the case of something like HIV and AIDS, these lysogenic cycles can go on for decades where you, when you're a kid, hopefully not, you know, when you're in love and married and whatever, you can be exposed to HIV, AIDS, things like that. And you might not have any symptoms for decades and later in life find out that you have it, right? Because it could be a lysogenic cycle that, that you don't have symptoms for these kind of viruses when they are just embedded into your DNA. You only have symptoms when they're in the lytic cycle, which they don't have to switch to for a very long time if the opportunity doesn't present itself. Okay, so the replicative cycles of animal viruses. So there are two key variables um, used to classify the viruses that infect animals. So the nature of the viral genome, whether it's single or double-stranded DNA or RNA, again, we said that RNA was called a retrovirus, and the presence or absence of an envelope, which we talked about a little bit earlier that are derived from the host cell's membrane. So viral envelopes. So an animal virus with an envelope uses it to enter the host cell. So the envelope is derived from the plasma membrane of a host cell, although some of the molecules on the envelope are specified by the genome of the virus. So is it identical to the outside of your host cells? No, it's just very close. So it's harder to detect from like your immune system wise. It's harder to detect that it's a foreign object. Okay, so here's essentially what's happening. You have, in this case, a retrovirus because this is an RNA-containing virus that has a protein coat. It has glycoproteins, and it has an envelope here. So it's going to get into the host cell. It's actually going to, like, fuse, like endocytose almost. It's going to fuse with the host cell's membrane, and it's going to be releasing the actual virus, so the protein coat and the... Um, the nucleic acid, which in this case is RNA. That RNA is actually going to go through something called reverse transcriptase. It's a, well, it's a enzyme that they carry in order to go from RNA backwards into DNA to make more of itself. Um, so it's going to go through that whole lytic process. And then as it's leaving, you'll see that in the, um, in the ER, we've created more of these glycoproteins that are destined to go to the outside of the cell, the cell membrane. So you'll see that as it's budding out, as it's like kind of exocytosing out of the cell, it's not busting open the cell. It's just stealing a piece of the cell because it told it to make certain glycoproteins and now it's surrounding itself with those glycoproteins on that envelope. So it's kind of like a double membrane around the outside of our viral particle. Um, okay, so RNA as genetic, uh, viral genetic materials. So the broadest variety of RNA genomes is found in viruses that affect animals. So retroviruses use reverse transcriptase, that's what I was talking about earlier, to copy their RNA genome into DNA. Because you know that if you have, like, let's say, mRNA, you can go backwards and find out what the DNA template was. And if you know half the DNA, you can figure out the other half of the DNA. That's essentially what reverse transcriptase does. It allows you to take the RNA and turn it into DNA. So now we have a double-stranded helix again. Um, HIV and AIDS are retroviruses that do have reverse transcriptase. This is how they're able to embed themselves into your host chromosomes, right? Because you have... Um, you have RNA that you're able to go backwards and turn into a double helix again, which can then become part of your genome. So the viral DNA that is integrated into the host genome is still called a um, provirus, and we called it a prophage before because those particular viruses were phages, bacteriophages. This is a provirus because now it's, in, it's a virus that's embedded <clears throat> into the host cell's chromosome. <clears throat> and unlike a prophage, a provirus is a permanent resident of the host cell. Okay, so they can still switch back and forth between lytic and lytic and lysogenic, 
but it's always going to start off as lysogenic and it becomes a permanent resident of that host cell. It never actually like becomes separate from it. So the host RNA polymerase um, transcribes the proviral DNA into RNA molecules and the RNA molecules function both as mRNA for the synthesis of the new viral proteins because we know that mRNA is then read by the ribosomes to make protein. Okay. And as genomes for the new viruses are released for the cell. Um, that's the two instances that you're going to be actually be utilizing the RNA molecules. So here's kind of what that looks like. <clears throat> this example is HIV. <coughs> I'm still dying a little bit. Forgive me. Um, so you can see that we have a viral envelope here. We have the glycoproteins on the outside. We have the capsid protecting the RNA that is on the inside. And you also have reverse transcriptase along with this. So then once the um, envelope fuses with the host cell, you're releasing the contents of the um, envelope into the host cell. So you have the protein coat, which will then kind of like disassemble and you have the release of our RNA transcript, our reverse transcriptase, which is going to function on the RNA of the virus. And then you're going to go through and create our DNA, which is now viral DNA that actually embeds itself into the host cells DNA. So you can see that happening in the nucleus. You have the chromosomal DNA and the provirus. It's called a provirus now because it is embedded into the host cells DNA. And then you have the RNA genome for the next viral generation that's going to be created through various processes, transcription, translation, all of that. Um, you're going to create the protein coats. So you're going to be creating copies of that RNA in order to embed them into the protein coats that you're making to assemble your new viruses and then release those. And again, it's picking up a cell um, or a viral envelope from the cell membrane as it's exiting the cell. Okay, so evolution of viruses. So viruses do not fit our definition of living organisms. We've talked about this before. They are particles, they are not cells. The cell is a basic unit of life. If it's not a cell, it's not alive. So since viruses can replicate only within cells, again, which are alive, they probably evolved after the first cells appeared because it wouldn't make sense for them to come first if they require a host. There would just be like, what, one virus particle just chilling, like not able to do anything. It makes sense that cells came first and then this was like a parasite that developed later. So candidates for the source of viral genomes are plasmids. <clears throat> so plasmids are circular DNA and bacteria and yeast cells and different transposons, um, which are small mobile DNA segments. These pass back and forth between a bunch of different like bacteria. Bacteria and yeast are kind of like, e they can easily pick up extracellular DNA. And that's why this is a good candidate. These plasmids are good candidates for possibly where viruses originated. <clears throat> so plasmids, transposons, and viruses are all mobile genetic elements. This is why they're able to transport nucleic acids between different organisms. So viruses are formidable pathogens in animals and plants. So diseases caused by viral infections can affect humans, crops, livestock. Sometimes we'll hear about a zoonotic disease, which is a disease that started in animals and can jump to humans, um, kind of like our H1N1, which I think it talks about a little bit later, which is a virus, which was the swine flu. You also have like the avian flu. These things originated in like livestock and then have moved into humans. But viruses affect a whole range of organisms, like animals, people are animals, more advanced animals, and then um, our crops as well. Like I was talking about the uh, tobacco mosaic virus earlier. So viral diseases in animals, viruses may damage or kill cells by causing the release of hydrolytic enzymes from lysosomes. So that's how they're breaking open the cells. Um, some viruses cause infec infected cells to produce toxins that lead to disease symptoms. So this, these toxins can spread throughout the body and cause symptoms. And then others have molecular components such as the envelope proteins that are toxic. Um, this is just kind of picked up by the immune system and they can cause all kinds of other symptoms to occur. Um, a vaccine is a harmless derivative of a pathogen that stimulates the immune system to mount defense against the harmful pathogen. So we have these for viruses pretty often. So vaccines can prevent certain viral illnesses, if you've heard of the flu shot, for instance. Um, but do note that there are like over a billion different types of the flu, and every year scientists guess which flu is going to become most prominent. And then those are the vaccines that they create for like two or three different strains that they believe will become an issue during that fall season, during that winter season. So every year the flu vaccine is like an educated guess of which of the billion type of flu viruses are going to become an issue. So then when you get vaccinated, 
you're only being vaccinated against two or three different types of the flu, but you could still get a, a one of those types of flu just at a less severe um, extent or one of the other billions of types of flu. So I don't know, people like really buy into the flu shot and then get mad when they still get the flu, but you're not protecting yourself against a billion strains, you're protecting yourself against three. It's it's just one of the, it's an educated guess. And sometimes they get it wrong. Like the weatherman, he gets the, the weather wrong all the time. It's changing all the time, right? I feel like the same thing is happening with viruses here. Like you're guessing which one is going to become prominent, which one's going to be the issue. And if you guess wrong, well, then a lot of people are still going to get sick, even though they have the vaccine. So that's how the flu shot works, for those of you that didn't know. Um, viral infections cannot be treated by antibiotics. This is one of the biggest things that drives me nuts when my kids are like, I have the flu, I need to go get some antibiotics. Okay, let's break down the word antibiotic. Anti means against, biotic means life. So literally the word means against life. Are viruses alive? No, I've said it about a billion times today. Viruses are not alive. Will antibiotics work against something that is abiotic? Absolutely not. It will not work. It will not work against it at all. Antibiotics are, are for bacterial infections. A viral infection is not a bacterial infection. So if you try to go to your doctor and they're not going to give you any antibiotics, it's because you have a virus and taking antibiotics is not going to do anything for you at all. Um, antiviral drugs, on the other hand, can help to treat, though not cure, the viral infections. Typically, they help to treat them by relieving your symptoms stuffy nose, runny nose, cough, sore throat. You can treat symptoms, but they're harder to treat because they're actually inside of your cells. So they're harder to treat, okay? Um, emerging viruses. So viruses that suddenly become apparent are called emerging viruses <clears throat> at coronavirus, right? It's emerging because it's probably been happening for a while, but now we're starting to hear about it. It's an emerging virus. Um, HIV is a classic example. Um, West Nile, not too long ago, well, not like 1999 long ago, but like not that long ago, probably 10 years ago, it was like a huge scare. Um, the West Nile virus appeared in North America first in 1999 and has now spread to 48 different states. Um, these are emerging viruses that suddenly become apparent. Does that mean that they just like cropped up out of the blue? No, it just means that now they're starting to infect people that are in places that can report the infections. Um, in 2009, a general outbreak or epidemic of a flu-like illness occurred in Mexico in the United States. The virus responsible was named H1N1, and they get those names based on the different, oh gosh, they get them based on the composition and the functionality and the originality of the uh, of the virus. So H1N1 refers to swine flu. Um, H1N1 spread rapidly, causing a pandemic or global ec epidemic. So it is something that is globally prominent. And that's kind of what's occurring right now with coronavirus as well. Um, some of these pictures probably seem like something you've seen in the uh, media quite recently or in an airport if you went anywhere over spring break. Um, so these are just, this is the um, 2009 pandemic H1N1 influenza A virus. This is the swine flu. And this is the um, public trying to protect themselves against the spread of said virus. Three processes contribute to the emergence of viral diseases. The mutation of already existing viruses, especially with RNA viruses, because they have like that extra step, there's another chance to mess up, make a mistake, that's a mutation. Uh, dissemination of viral diseases from a small isolated human population, allowing the disease to go unnoticed before it begins to spread. This is how we get a lot of our emerging diseases because you don't really know that they're there, but they're there until someone either travels into or out of that area and carries it with them because travel is very easy nowadays in 2020. Um, and then the spread of existing viruses from animal populations to humans. Those are called zoonotic diseases when they originate in an animal and spread to a human, like swine flu, um, avian flu, bird flu. Um, about 75% of new human diseases originate this way, which is a huge percentage, right? But these are the different ways that we get the emergence of new viral diseases. Um, strains of influenza A are given standardized names. This is what I was talking about before. So the name H1N1 <laughs> identifies the forms of two viral surface proteins. Okay, that's what it was. Human proteins, uh, surface proteins, the hemagglutinin, which is H, and neuraminidase, which is N. So that H and N, that's where it comes from. It's the proteins that are actually on the surface 
of this particular virus. Um, there are numerous types of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase um, identified by different numbers. That's why it's the ones after these two. Uh, viral diseases in plants. More than 2,000 types of viral diseases of plants are known. Um, these have enormous impacts on the agricultural and horticultural industries. Like I said a long time ago, there was like the um, the tobacco crops were like wiped out and that like kind of crippled that industry in America. Um, plant viruses have some <clears throat> the same basic structure and mode of replication as animal viruses. Uh, most plant viruses known thus far have an RNA genome and may have a helical capsid. That's just the shape overall, which is advantageous for affecting, infecting plants. Otherwise, they wouldn't have it. Uh, plant viral diseases spread by two major routes. Um, the infection from an external source of virus is called a horizontal transmission. Um, herbivores, especially insects, pose a double threat because they can both carry a virus and help it get um, past the plant's outer layer of leaf cells. So if they're like picking up little viral particles from one plant and then they go and they bite another one to try to start eating it, they're actually getting into the inner layers of the tissue that aren't as protected as the outer layers. Um, an inheritance of the virus from a parent is called vertical transmission. So horizontal is from like one plant to another. That can be plant to plant or like an insect, like a vector sort of thing. Or you can have the vertical transmission where it's inherited. Okay, we made it to the end of viruses. Please be educated about the coronavirus after all of this. Please don't be like, I need to be on antibiotics. Also, why is Costco out of water bottles and toilet paper? I think people are confused. It's an upper respiratory tract infection. Upper respiratory tract, respiration, lungs, your airways. Why are people buying toilet paper like their lives are depending on it? Like, it's not going to make your butt explode. It's not like a stomach virus. I'm just confused. Anyway, please don't buy into the hype of the media. Yes, viruses can be scary, but if you've survived the flu, odds are you will survive the coronavirus. It's just the media overhyping things and taking advantage of people who are not educated on the, the subject of viruses in general that are causing the hype. Please don't be part of it because now you are better educated. You understand viruses. They are not something that is alive. And dumping a whole bunch of Purell on things is not going to fix anything at all. They're not alive in the first place, and the protein coat very much protects them from the small amount of alcohol that's actually going to make contact with them before it evaporates. So now that you have some education on this, please go and educate your friends and family and be like, calm down. It's okay. We're all going to be okay. It's a virus. It's not alive. Please don't ask for antibiotics. Your doctors are going to be like, why are you doing this? Be better than that. Have a great day.